Hello and welcome, and thank you so much for joining us for this very special edition of, debate of the France 24 debate. I'm Gallagher Fenwick. We are standing just a stone's throw away from a site where a devastating explosion took place nearly two months ago to the day. We are in Beirut for this, a very special day, one of solidarity between France and Lebanon. France 24 is partnered up with an exceptional concert taking place in Paris's magnificent and famed concert hall, the Olympia Concert Hall in downtown Paris. There, headliners are helping to raise funds and awareness about the plight of the Lebanese people. France 24, again, is proudly partnered up with that effort. The United Nations office here in Lebanon, when assessing the damage caused by this explosion, explained that the 15 seconds of the blast in the damages caused was the quasi-equivalent of the civil war that lasted 15 years, bloody, divided, and hurt this country badly between 1975 and 1990. Two months after that blast, France 24 is here for an exceptional debate. Without further ado, I'd like to inter introduce my very distinguished uh, panel, my guests here. We'll start with you, Lynn Taney. You are a journalist, a former senior advisor to the Lebanese uh, Ministry of Culture. You actually quit your job soon after the explosion that lifted this big crater that we see behind us because you were so frustrated, you told me, with the government official response. And you are now a committee member of the Beirut Heritage Initiative, I guess that for you, rebuilding starts with preserving historical treasures. We'll talk more about that later. Thank you so much for joining us. To my left is Peter Murakad. You are a social activist. You founded a couple grassroots organizations. One of them is Base, uh, Base Camp Beirut, in a nutshell. What's the mission statement and the purpose of Base Camp Beirut? Um, to provide relief to the people who have lost everything, medical, psychological, um, houses, reconstruction, uh, and also food and access to water. We'll be talking about those yeah. challenges and, and how people can help. Thank you so much for Thank being part of this uh, special France 24 debate. To my right, Dr. Uh, Alexandre Naame, excuse yes. my pronunciation, you are the uh, chief medical officer, chief orthopedic surgeon as well at St. George Hospital in Beirut, a facility which was nearly obliterated by this uh, uh, blast. You'll be talking to us about the uh, personal challenges that that poses, but also the very professional concerns that you're faced with on a uh, daily basis, of course. And uh, last but not least, Marseille Kelly. Now, uh, full disclosure, Marseille Kelly is my boss. He is the director of Friends 24, but that is not why I invited him to be a part of this conversation. I wanted you, Mark, to be a part of this conversation because to me, you embody the very strong ties between France and Lebanon. We'll be talking about that yes, relationship sure, sure. and what it means for you and where those countries stand uh, sure. in your professional life, sure. of course. Again, thank you so much for joining us for this exceptional France 24 debate. You can join the conversation online as well via Twitter, hashtag F24Debate, and on the Facebook page, the France 24 debate. Without further ado, let's begin this thought-provoking, I hope, and compelling conversation with you, Lynn Taney. Yes. I'd like to start by making it a little personal. We have a lot of English-speaking viewers who are watching this. They may not be familiar with Lebanon, a Middle Eastern country, where it stands, its history, the relationship with France and whatnot, but also the many challenges that you face in your daily lives here. Can you give me a personal anecdote, perhaps, about how absurd at times or complicated, difficult life can get uh, in Beirut these days? Especially after the explosion. It's been, uh, it's been a daily challenge for everybody, for people that are on the ground, for the NGOs, for the experts, for, for everybody, for ordinary citizens who today struggle, even though they have to go to buy uh, uh, like uh, milk or, 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 or bread. We, have, we are facing huge challenges today in Lebanon. We have the COVID-19. We have an economical crisis, and above that, we have this tragedy that had occurred on uh, August 4. So it's a daily challenge. Uh, uh, maybe in Europe, uh, people do not, uh, maybe do, they can't understand what we're living, but uh, 
but uh, we, uh, Lebanese are uh, resilient uh, people, so I hope we will be able to, uh, to get through it. Resilience is a word that comes back in many conversations with the Lebanese, those who choose to stay here, those who return, uh, those who lead struggles to help in the process of rebuilding. You are one of those, Peter Murakat, social activist, founding member of Base Camp Beirut. Can you tell us a little bit about the challenges involved in this process of rebuilding and some of the stumbling blocks between people like you, efforts to rebuild and a sort of return to normal life, whatever that means in Beirut. Let's talk about the return to normality in a few years from now. Right now, we're trying to absorb what's happening. Um, I mean, I, I don't think I've, I'd ever imagined myself to be sitting here at the forefront and behind me have such a dramatic, nightmarish backdrop. This it's is a our capital. 40 meter deep crater over there, 40 meters deep. That's, that's the capital of Lebanon. That's Beirut City. Mm. And, you know, uh, it, it, I don't know, like, I'm, I'm, I'm being extremely emotional right now, but I think that the Lebanese people are feeling some, the, the ones who have survived this are feeling survivor's guilt. And it's a thing, it's a medical condition. And I think we all need to deal with that. Um, but I'll, I'll say something about resilience. Resilience have, has an, and has always been our strength as Lebanese people. But today, I think we do not want to be resilient anymore. We want a change. We want a tangible change. You know, when they say, if it ain't broken, don't fix it. Yeah. It's broken. We have to fix it. Mm -hmm. And so from day one, we decided to go down to the ground, um, us and hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of volunteers. We saw images pouring in of people coming from the north, from Absolutely. Tripoli, from other parts of the country, That's correct. regardless of their differences, confessions, we'll be talking about that, and coming here picking up the rubble because others who were supposed to do so weren't doing that. We'll come back to this very important part of the conversation. You talked about medical conditions. We have Dr. Alexander Nehmed, Chief Medical Officer of St. George Hospital, a hospital that kind of looks like the building that we're sitting in here right now. It was one of the most affected, impacted uh, medical facilities, nearly devastated, obliterated, can you tell us about the state that your hospital is in for the moment? Just yeah. blown facades, windows, doors, equipment? I want to tell you, uh, St. George Hospital is one of the three major hospitals in Lebanon. It's a 400-bed facility. It's a university and teaching medical center. It was functioning, and then the blast came. And uh, like you saw in the footages all over the planet, uh, uh, the blast was immense, and we stopped uh, the operation uh, at one time. So the first challenge that we had to face was to evacuate the people uh, that were present in the premises uh, of the hospital. Uh, the hospital was completely non-functional. Uh, the ER uh, was completely devastated and you had all uh, the surrounding uh, people of the neighborhood that in their head they, ha they, they uh, saw, they were thinking that uh, St. George Hospital is still functioning. So they were uh, keeping on coming to the emergency room. So uh, uh, the nurses here uh, and all the paramedical staff and uh, the residents were uh, behaved like heroes. They uh, uh, had lacerations, they had tendons, uh, they had fractures correct, in correct the me if I'm Correct me if I'm wrong, yeah. the blast caused um, tens of deaths, I think 100... We had 30 deaths, 130 17 deaths. immediate, 4 nurses, uh, 13 visitors and uh, uh, patients. Uh, and then we lost 14 in the neighboring uh, uh, hospitals. And in Beirut, overall, I think we're talking about more than 169, 70 deaths. Almost thousands who were injured, injured. Yes. And hundreds of thousands who lost their homes. Mike Saikeli, let me turn to you. Do you think that um, Beirut, and perhaps Lebanon as well, is at risk of seeing the emergence of a sort of lost generation, people who simply have no future left here, no prospects, no personal, no professional prospects. Is that what's at risk of happening if there isn't more solidarity pouring in and something concrete, as Peter was saying, doesn't happen very soon? People, young people especially, have no perspective at all. Because here in the country, when you cross the streets of Beirut, you see young people and private uh, people are rebuilding yeah. with their own money. You have no state, no institution, no, 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 object, no goals, nothing. You have nothing. So people are leaving. 
the younger generation is leaving the country. So what is the solution? I don't know. When we were talking about re resilience, it's over now. People are fed up with this. People want to leave because they don't trust the, the politicians, a anyone. Yeah. Because all the Lebanese politicians started in the 70s by being the warlords. And then they started, they are all involved in corruption. And that's what, why this country is so, so bad and so sad situation. We'll, we'll talk about how you know people from outside can help. I think that one country, and you know this perhaps better than anyone here, is very involved, is France. Let's first look at, at a story put together by Nadia Masi about how the French president very recently reacted in rare, harsh, in the diplomatic sphere terms uh, when he learned that the government, uh, Lebanese government had quit and, and failed to form a, a cabinet to adequately respond to the crisis. Have a look at this story. J'ai honte pour vos dirigeants. J'ai honte pour eux. The French president pulling no punches, speaking the day after Lebanon's prime minister quit, unable to form a government, Emmanuel Macron was as scathing as he was direct. This was a failure of the entire political class. Personne n'a été à la hauteur des engagements pris le 1er septembre dernier. Tous ont fait le pari du pire dans le seul but de se sauver eux-mêmes, de sauver les intérêts de leur famille, de leur clan. Je décide donc de prendre acte de cette trahison collective. Ils emportent l'entière responsabilité. Macron, though, saved his greatest anger for Hezbollah. The party's determination to wield influence at the finance ministry a major reason behind the collapse of talks. Le Hezbollah ne peut en même temps être une armée en guerre contre Israël, une milice déchaînée contre les civils en Syrie et un parti respectable au Liban. France's frustrations are evident, but with his roadmap for Lebanon ending abruptly in failure, Macron hasn't offered up an alternative strategy yet. He says sanctions aren't an option, for now at least. Instead, all he's confirmed is to discuss the way forward with international partners, notably not Lebanese ones, and to hold an international aid conference by the end of October. Harsh words coming from the uh, uh, French uh, President Marc. Um, do you think that at this point the only form of uh, real help that can come to Lebanon can only come from outside this country and, and perhaps France? Yes, because first of all, the dark side of it is that this country is open to all interference coming from outside, from Iran, from Saudi Arabia, yeah, from Lebanon the is US. in a very tough neighborhood, yes, right? Yes, and from Syria, from Turkey. And the only positive interference, if you could call it like this, is the French one, because France just want to help Lebanese people to rebuild the kind of state and making reforms. But this is a very tough challenge for President Macron. You know that everyone in Lebanon doesn't necessarily agree with that interpretation. Yeah, sure. Let's have a, a quick listen uh, to the way the Secretary General of Hezbollah, Hassan Nasrallah, responded to President Macron's harsh words. Have a listen. When you come and say that all political forces and governmental institutions have committed a betrayal, whatever that may be, betrayal or betrayers. What are you basing that on? How? Who said they committed betrayal? First of all, we don't accept your accusation of betrayal, and we reject and condemn this condescending behavior towards us and towards all political forces. Lynn. Uh, Marc was just talking about solidarity coming from uh, France. Um, I have two questions for you. Uh, first of all, how do you finance uh, the Beirut Heritage Initiative, which you're a committee member of? There is a, you know, a huge economic crisis. People's savings have evaporated somehow in Lebanon. How do you fund or funnel or, or channel money into an operation like, like yours? 
Uh, the Beirut Heritage Initiative is a collective or a platform that is independent and inclusive. And uh, our final purpose is to rebuild the heritage. So today you have more than 700 uh, heritage buildings who were destroyed in this area. The idea is to fundraise. Until now, these are uh, private people, private donors that are supporting. We are waiting for uh, international help. Like uh, we have a lot of promises. We have UNESCO, the general director of UNESCO, Audrey Azoulay, visited Lebanon. She promised to help. Alone, we can do anything. We all know that the state has no money. Lebanon is, uh, is broke, I can say it. And uh, we, we count on uh, private initiatives private donors and more importantly uh, international donors because we need to rebuild the patrimonial buildings and the heritage building we need 300 million dollars if people who are watching this program adhere to your cause and want to and want to help fund it do you have a website how do they go of about course. it we have a facebook page we have a, a what's it called uh, the beirut heritage initiative we also have a uh, an Instagram page. We have a website under construction. Why under construction? Because we were not prepared. Uh, like a lot of NGOs working underground, we have Peter here who would agree with me. We, we were created uh, because we wanted to face this emergency. So, uh, so we are open to all donations and we need help. All the NGOs, like maybe people are not really interested in heritage or rebuilding the urban fabric, but today the Lebanese people need help and a lot of NGOs are doing a great job on the ground. Same question to you, doctor, chief medical officer at uh, the St. George uh, Medical Facility Hospital out here in Beirut, which was nearly obliterated by the blast. Is it a publicly funded or is it a private facility? It's a private facility. Uh, so we are heavily relying on international help and uh, philanthropy and on local donors in order to uh, be able to rebuild. Since day uh, zero or day one, uh -huh. we uh, initiated an emergency recovery plan and we were able to come up sequentially with some of the services of the hospital, including uh, operating rooms, emergency rooms, uh, some of the uh, rooms also, mm -hmm. but in a suboptimal way because we have no windows, no doors. We had to obliterate the windows yeah. with uh, glass, with uh, wood and yeah. all that. And uh, I think uh, all private institutions that are needing help need to identify projects in order for donors to give accurately according to projects. And I think that m many of the donors have given other institutions that were merely affected by the blast because they were much more organized than uh, our hospital. They have a fundraising machine that is up and running. So you have, you have other institutions, I won't name them, that received millions of dollars in spite of the fact that they, were, they had some uh, glasses broken. While our institution was completely uh, out of, uh, of the state of, uh, of work, and we received, our losses are 40 million euros. 40 we received million. like 10 to 15 percent of this uh, number so, so far. So yeah. we heavily rely on international help and on France help. France already helped us through Mrs. Macron uh -huh. and uh, the AP, uh, La PHP. They gave us uh, some money. The public and hospital we have a project that is yeah. dealt with. Uh, okay, Doxé now. Okay, uh, France's foreign ministry. Yeah, definitely. And same thing for you. Peter, if people want to help finance or fund Base Camp Beirut, which is involved on efforts on the ground to rebuild, clean up, how do they go about it? Do you guys have a, a website? So right now, Base Camp and what happened on the ground is mainly civic movements, right? Mm -hmm. So not organized NGOs. And organized NGOs have a proper funding structure and all of that. So they, yes, they did receive a lot of funding. That doesn't mean that they were necessarily on the ground. Uh, but if you actually go to the ground, if you do a little bit of research, you'll re realize that there are about four or five main NGOs that are doing fantastic work on the ground. Some of them, uh, you know, I'll just name a few of them, Beit Nabaitak, uh, Beit El Baraka, the Lebanese Red Cross, of um, and a few others. Uh, but my, my main point here is you have a lot of volunteers who are being extremely efficient on the ground, and then you have UN agencies. And then the time it takes for the international funding to go to UN agencies and then be distributed along the right channels to the right NGOs and to the right civic movements on the ground, then this, this is a time that we do not ha have in relief. We need immediacy, and immediacy is still needed today when you have families that do not have access to hygiene, to water, 
to basic needs. You have people that come to our medical center that do not have the financial means to go to a hospital with wounds that are gaping wounds in the forehead, in the arms, stitches that they don't have the means to afford or to clean. They're coming to us, the civic society on the ground, and we need to be very efficient in finding the right channels to fund those. Right now at base camp, under the umbrella of an NGO, that, because base camp is a coalition of mm -hmm. different movements, there's one NGO called Beit Na Beitak. We have dedicated a sub account for base camp where people can actually fund the immediate relief needs on the ground. We at France 24 are also partnered up, as I mentioned earlier, with an important concert taking place in Paris called United for Lebanon at the Olympia Concert Hall with many he headliners helping raise awareness and funds. Marc Saikeli, director of France 24, why was it so important for France 24, our channel, to partner up with this initiative, United for Lebanon? Because I think it's our duty. I think we are in about uh, 400 million households in the world and the situation he's here is so unbelievable. The damages is so huge. Just uh, let me tell you, in this building where we're in, four people died in this mm. building. Mm. So the damages are unbelievable. And we, and France 24, we wanted to show the world what's happening here. Because people here need help. Because people here, if, if you see, may, even if you see them, proud and they need help they have nothing the, their money is stuck in the banks the state is no state they they just live with the help of their own families they are building by themselves mm -hmm. and with the help of some western countries especially France and the NGOs God bless them because otherwise there's nothing that's why we wanted to focus on this situation two months after the blasts and to show the rest of the world what's happening here. Because you know, in our jobs, when the news is last more than two or three weeks, people forget, forget. it. Exactly. So we have to remind people. It's important to come back to a story to assess yes. developments down the line, which is why the France 24 debate, if you're just joining us, is exceptionally in Beirut, nearly two months after a blast that tore through large chunks of the city, killed tens, injured thousands, and displaced hundreds of thousands of people. Dr. Uh, Naime, uh, Chief Medical Officer at St. George uh, Hospital, you briefly touched upon a problem that keeps coming back in conversations I've been having here in Beirut ever since I arrived. Corruption. How big a problem is it? Please explain for our viewers who are not familiar with the situation in Beirut. What is this conversation about? Why does co corruption keep coming out? Who is corrupt? How does that process unfold? And why is it such a big stumbling block between folks like yourselves and efforts to rebuild? I think most of the politicians are corrupt. Uh, that's why we ended up with this situation. Uh, I cannot comment more because I'm not an economist, but from what you see, uh, since I was a child uh, until I'm uh, 50 uh, now, the country is going down uh, uh, gradually. But in spite of that, I would like to convey a message of hope because I'm a firm believer in Lebanon, even though corruption is there. And uh, I came back from France after uh, having spent 14 years over there. I had the possibility to stay over there and to have a famous career. I went to the States afterwards. And in spite of all of that, I came back to Lebanon. And I still believe in Lebanon in spite of all uh, what's happening. And uh, an example that I'd like to give you is uh, the solidarity that we had after the blast. For the first three weeks, uh, we are 1,700 employees at St. George Hospital. We were all present over there, of course, not the uh, injured. And we had 500 young volunteers coming from all over Lebanon to help us daily, daily in cleaning up. But and should, not, should up that not be the job of people hired by the government, of officials, local, yes, but national, no, undertaking this I, effort? I completely agree with you. But when you are in Lebanon, you have uh, uh, to accept that Lebanon is uh, not an ideal country, and it will never be an ideal country. Wars have been raging in Lebanon since 5,000 years. And I don't think that now this Carrefour or this uh, uh, cross, uh, crossroad, pass, yeah. crossroad uh, between all civilizations will, uh, will change. Things will remain like this. Either you believe that you want to stay in Lebanon or you have to leave. 
I'm a firm believer in Lebanon and I will stay no matter what happens. Staying and to a certain extent accepting a form of status quo as uncomfortable as it may be, you know a thing or two about history. Lebanon is indeed in a very tough neighborhood with its uh, neighbors, Syria, Israel, other countries. Um, it was a protectorate of France a hundred years ago. A mandate. Yeah, a mandate. Yeah, yeah. There, there was a French mandate. Um, can you explain to us, in your mind, in your eyes, where does this corruption come from? In the conversations I've had on the ground here, people keep telling me about the way this system is organized. And I think that that, date, that dates back to the French mandate. Is it time for this political system based on divisions along confessional lines? The president is a Christian, the prime minister a Sunni Muslim, the speaker of the chamber a Shia. Is it time to get rid of that and, and try a different system? There's a lot of discussion about this story, especially after what, has, uh, what had occurred after the explosion and uh, also after the economic situation we're living. There is a lot of thinking, a lot of people are already thinking about how the, this country will be divided. But it's very complicated because uh, I'm going to say maybe genetically, people have been used to thinking about their confession before thinking about, the, about their country. And this is one of the reasons that led to what we are today here in Lebanon. Mm -hmm. It's not only corruption, about, it's not only a money thing, it's also a lot... Uh, uh, sociological, sociological, social, cultural... Sociological, cultural, and uh, uh, confessional. Um, mm -hmm. It's, 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 it's uh, several things, not, not only mm -hmm. one thing. So I don't know where it will lead. There's a lot of thinking about maybe it's the only solution mm -hmm. to, to, to divide the country into different uh, areas where everyone would live uh, uh, according to your uh, to its confession, but it's yeah. also very complicated. Lebanon isn't a big country. Is it economically viable? Uh, uh, it's it's there's a lot of thinking about Lebanon's identity today, especially uh, as a result of the economical crisis and as a re as a result of the explosion, because the explosion wasn't perceived the same way in other. I'm gonna I'm, I won't mm. criticize what what uh, what's the perception of the people, but some people uh, uh, aren't sensibilized to what happened in Beirut, uh -huh. uh, maybe because they don't really relate to the people that were impacted. There's a, there's a, it, it's, it's very complicated. Lebanon has always been a very complicated country, so it's very difficult to resume it in a, in a debate. But I'm going to say there is a discussion about this thinking, but I don't know what's, what will happen in the months who will follow. Peter, you certainly aren't one to accept the status quo. You want things to change. You said that uh, resilience, that part of the story is over. We need to act. We need concrete change. I know you're highly distrustful of the local political class. That means that help perhaps should and could come from outside the country. The French president, as Marc was saying earlier, offered help, concrete steps. He walked through these streets, very striking images. Are you not worried, though, of outside influences as well? Do you accept all forms of solidarity from outside of Lebanon, wherever they may come from? France's help is very much welcome. Thank you, France 24, for giving us the opportunity, the plateau, the, 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 you know, the visibility to be able to express ourselves uh, and for the world to not forget about us, right? Because we are uh, two months uh, in the explosion. Now, I believe in change, and change is necessary today. And when we say change, it has to go the whole political class needs to just be changed. How does no that exceptions. happen? It's, that's easy no to exceptions. say, but how do you make it happen? We have to make it happen. How? And this is not just international influence. It has to come from the people. People have to go to the elections. They have to say, we refuse to be working with these, with these corrupts, with these warlords that have been ruling Lebanon and have been uh, leading us to a nuclear explosion. This can no longer happen. Our generation, there's a young, new generation that is incredible, the younger generation. Mm -hmm. We've seen them on the ground. None of us were disaster management experts, and yet we were able. We were able to go to 3,000 households. I'm talking about just one initiative out of hundreds of initiatives. We were able to provide food relief to 200 households. We were able to rebuild 500 houses. So this is just one drop in this ocean, but I believe that this drop is going to create a ripple, and this ripple needs to be a tsunami of change. And the change, we need to believe in it, and we need to go back to the urns, 
uh, to, uh, and we need to make sure that we remove, so vote them out. remove that political class, all of them, because they nurture themselves by creating this confessional uh, sort of uh, uh, animosity between each other. We need to, you know, remove that shirt that says what your confession is or your area mm -hmm. and put on a new shirt that's called Lebanon and Lebanon needs to be neutral. Yes, we are at crossroads. Yes, we are on a tectonic plate. Yes, we, the volcano has erupted, but we need to take charge or no one else will be able to take charge for us. When you see um, governments in this neighborhood extending what in appearance looks like a, a helping hand, the country to the south of Lebanon, help being offered by the government in Tehran. Are those also acceptable forms of solidarity? Or do you see perhaps a wicked agenda behind those, those offers? Do you think all forms of solidarity are welcome? Or do you discriminate between the offers? Or do you have to discriminate between, between the offers? We need to be extremely wise because there are agendas and there are a lot of agendas because the stakes of Lebanon are high geopolitically speaking. We need to work with partners that will ensure the sovereignty, the identity of this country, the neutrality of this country. We need to re-become a Switzerland. And by being a Switzerland, that means that we do not interfere and we are not interested in the conflicts of the region. And this is only when everyone in Lebanon believes in that, that's when we will be able to transform and reform. Marc, um, we've heard a lot about France, obviously, and, and you know that relationship is, is very strong. Other than the shared history between France and Lebanon, how do you explain that very strong chemistry between these two countries, these two peoples on both sides of the Mediterranean? You share both of those identities. How compatible are they? And would it be cliche to say that your heart is in Beirut, your mind is in Paris, or how does that relationship function? Are they on an equal standing? In Lebanese people used to say, our mother France. This sentence explains the deep and strong relations. It started in the 13th century when the French king Saint Louis promises an, an eternal protection at that time to the Christian in the area. And then you had the secret agreements of Sykes-Picot in 1916 uh, uh, that gave a major role to France, France. here. Mm -hmm. And from that time, France is very important. And let me say that Lebanon is the last place in the Middle East where France has a role. So Lebanese people know that. They speak French, by the way. A lot of Lebanese, Lebanese people, this is important for our English-speaking viewers. All of a your guests here they all speak French. French as good as Arabic and English. Yeah. And people here are open-minded because of the geography of the country. You have a small coastline and then mountains, and behind the mountains, the deserts and the enemies of the past centuries. And so people here in Lebanon used to look to the sea and to the Western, to Europe mainly, and then to United States and uh, Latin America. So people here live in front of the sea, looking beyond the sea. Lin, you could have left. You could be part of those um, who chose to, you know, pack their bags and, and go away. As a matter of fact, when I flew in to Beirut from Paris, a lot of the people who were sitting next to me on the plane were talking about the fact that they were just coming back to pick things up and go back to Paris. There was no hope of staying. They were talking about the lack of electricity, the lack of uh, sure. um, sanitary equipment, measures not being respected, um, and just so many problems that they simply had felt like they had no future here. Why did you choose to stay? I might be leaving, to be honest. I'm, I'm, it's, it's, it's the last hope. Like We decided, uh, uh, for instance, Beirut Heritage Initiatives and other NGOs I've been working on, Lebanon of Tomorrow and others, that it's our last um, if you want effort, this is our last effort, last chance. To, last chance to rebuild. If it won't work now, we have like six months. If we do, we won't have international help, no international donors, no uh, no uh, political change, 
we will be leaving and the numbers will be will double and triple and there might be no Lebanon or a Lebanon that doesn't look like we want it to look, you know. Dr. Name, you were mentioning earlier, you know, a career in the States, in France, beautiful prospects abroad, but you choose to stay with, you know, your family and the conditions around us, which are what they are, obviously. Why so? Because this is my country. And I think uh, uh, it's, it's not a duty, it is a duty, but it's uh, my well-being uh, is, uh, uh, is there when I'm in, in Lebanon. Uh, you know, uh, uh, I was in France for 15 years. I have the French nationality. I, I, I love France. It's my uh, second home. Uh, mother France, like uh, uh, your boss uh, said. Uh, we love France, but, but the feeling of well-being, uh -huh. at least I'm speaking for myself, yeah. that I have in this country uh, has no equal. And I choose my well-being by uh, being in Lebanon in spite of all odds. So unlike Lynn, even if reconstruction isn't completed in six months, you will continue staying? I, I will stay. Even if the crises keep compounding? I think I have a mission. COVID-19, uh, refugees, uh, corruption, COVID-19 is everywhere. Uh, you know, uh, I think I'm a strong believer in this country and I'll, I'll try to stay uh, unless there is a huge security threat uh, uh, for on my life and my, uh, my family. Otherwise, uh, I will stay. Those who stay, those who are hesitant, staying for now, but might be leaving. Now, if now we're fighting until the last breath. Uh -huh. I don't know when it will be. I think we have like less than a year for the, everything to be clear for everyone. And uh, if it won't work, people like me who have kids, like young kids, we want for them the best. Mm -hmm. if, if you're a dad, you know you want for your kids the best. And if the best is not for in this country, as much as you love Lebanon, mm -hmm. you'll have to take them because you want for them the best, unfortunately. Those who are active on the ground, um, which camp are you in? Are you gonna stay no matter what? Are you thinking of leaving? Where do you stand in this conversation? I don't think you can ask that question. I think it's a very indecent question. I'll tell you why. Because we are troubled right now, all of us. We're numb, right? And I don't think any Lebanese wants to leave the country. I think at least those who have stayed, those who decided to come back, and those who left but are still talking about Lebanon, still funding Lebanon, still raising, still, you know, we all have Lebanon in our blood. Then it becomes a personal choice, and that choice has to do with where you stand on that great pyramid of Maslow that we learn in uh, management schools. And you know, you build a career, and you grow, and you ascend. And guess what? With an explosion of the size of what happened, we're all now at the basic level of survival mm -hmm. across classes, across religions, across segregated uh, uh, political parties. We are at ground zero, okay? So either we decide to take things in hand or the country will no longer exist. That's how dramatic things are. Where do I stand? I have a family, my wife is pregnant. I have a two-year-old toddler. Congratulations. Thank you so much. And um, I'm not able to feel joyful about the newborn that's on his way, you know, or her way because we feel like we've been shaken to our core, and I cannot answer you today. So much blame to go around, Mark. I know that fingers are often pointed at the Lebanese political class. We heard the French president accusing the Lebanese political leaders of having betrayed their people. But is there enough blame to go around and for everyone to share? Is every Lebanese person, are all the Lebanese sort of responsible for what is happening in their country? Or is, or is the Lebanese class the sole responsible in this crisis, solely responsible? The first rank Lebanese politician class is all corrupted. Peter said it really clearly. You I think cannot, that not a single people, politician not came a single, here. Not a single Lebanese first rank politician can make a change. Peter explained it very well. And, but it's hard to understand because in French we used to say that if you understand Lebanon, mm -hmm. it means 
that someone didn't explain it very well. <laughs> you know, you cannot understand. So difficult, so complicated. You have so many confessions, religions, parties, interests, families, clans. So it's very, very complicated. But I share the hope. I share the hope because people here is an incredible people. The Lebanese people is an incredible people who is rebuilding, rebuilding, rebuilding. All of those has their apartments or hospitals destroyed. They don't talk about it, but they rebuilt and they will rebuild. And people don't want to leave like this. They are leaving. They are leaving. But how, how can you tell them don't leave? Because there's nothing here. No electricity, no water, no state, no infrastructures, no help, no, nothing, nothing. People that are left alone. We're close to the end of the show. I'd like a last word from every single one of you. We'll start with you, Dr. Alexandre Name. Resilience, despite the odds. Yes, yes, I can. Uh, You'll stay no matter it. what happens. I, I think so. Okay. I think so. And uh, we're. You know, we're, we're, we have rebuilt a little bit the hospital. We have 200 beds up and running. We had uh, a project of opening up uh, a new school of medicine in spite of all the odds. We are back on track to uh, this, this week. We restarted uh, the meetings between the different committees in order to organize this new school of medicine. And uh, we are hopeful. We are here. Dr. Alexandre Name, Chief Medical Officer at St. George Hospital in Beirut, thank you so much for having thank joined this exceptional much. France 24 debate. Lynn Penny, a last word from you. Yes, a message to the world, since a lot of people are watching. Please don't forget Lebanon. We still need a lot of help, a lot of, of fundraising, and this country is worth fighting for. Lynn Haney, committee member of the Beirut Init uh, Heritage Initiative, yes. thank you so much for having joined us. Peter Murakad, a last word, maybe? Be the change be the change you want to see in the world. And I say that to the 16 million strong Lebanese in Lebanon and outside of Lebanon, you can all exert tremendous pressure. And to the internationals who are watching us, I thank you for your time. I thank you for the, for the confidence. And I thank you and I please don't stop believing in Lebanon. Our identity depends on every single one. Peter Murakad, founder of uh, Basecamp Beirut, Thank you so much for having Thank been you. a part of the France 24 debate. Marc Saikali, one last word from you. We're making our job, our duty as France 24, but these people deserve it because we are so impressed by the courage of the, the Lebanese people that if we, if we don't help or we don't let know what's our job, this mm -hmm. Marc Saïkali, Director of France 24, thank you so much for having been part of this exceptional debate. And thank you all for having watched this very exceptional France 24 debate from Beirut on the occasion of a day of solidarity between France and Lebanon. France 24 partnered up with United for Lebanon concert in the famed Olympia Concert Hall in Paris. Thank you so much for watching. You can watch it again on our website, france24.com. Stay tuned for more news.